I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Eric Stecker, an Assistant Professor of Medicine at Oregon Health and Science University. Dr. Stecker has written a perspective article on Oregon's new experiment with Accountable Care Organizations, or ACOs. Dr. Stecker, what are the key features of an ACO, and what makes Oregon's Coordinated Care Organizations, or CCOs, what some have called ACOs on steroids? Well, Stephen, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, ACOs have been structured to more tightly integrate providers in the fairly fragmented U.S. healthcare landscape and to provide incentives to better align and promote high-quality care and lower-cost care both simultaneously. There's a lot of flexibility in how ACOs can be structured and paid. And this is done, I think, partly in order to avoid some of the backlash experienced by the more vertically integrated and closed coverage models of managed care in the 1990s. But most people agree that whether horizontal or vertical, there should be some effective integration between different organizational elements, and that there needs to be a reasonable capitation component to the global payment structure of ACOs. Although the term capitation has become a, a dirty word in health policy circles, it is still in play in global payments. Regarding ACOs on steroids, uh, that term, I think Oregon CCOs have been described in that manner for several reasons. First, they rely on a heavily capitated method of per-member uh, payment that incorporates physical health, mental health, and dental health into the same budget. Uh, this will hopefully disincentivize siloed care and, um, incre- and the inclination to do more based on, on payment methods that are often pretty dissociated from the value of care provided. The second reason is that the federal waiver that allows this Medicaid experiment allows greater discretion in how the money is spent. For example, Governor Kitzhaber gives a great description of how, theoretically, in a summer heat wave, a caseworker who feels that a $200 window air conditioner could avoid a hospital admission for a frail elderly patient uh, would be allowed to use CCO funds to buy and install it. And then lastly, uh, incentives and requirements to ensure high-quality care are in place um, while at the same time achieving cost savings, and they're, they're really pretty well defined. We don't know whether in practice they can withstand what's likely to be a a real imperative for cost savings, but they have been well thought out and well defined. Why then did Oregon decide to plunge into a program like this for its poorest population, for people who are covered by Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program? The ACO model was applied to Medicaid and CHIP patients out of necessity, really. The Oregon governors, particularly Governor Kitzhaber, as well as legislators, have a longstanding commitment to provide broad-based and effective care for these patients. And really the combination of the Great Recession and rapidly escalating health care costs has stretched this commitment almost to the breaking point. The ACO program was launched to provide an innovative way to shore up the program financially uh, while maintaining quality. Uh, And coincidentally, it also provides a model that could be applied to other states' Medicaid programs and perhaps even Medicare or private insurance programs. We know that some experiments involving ACOs or their precursors showed reasonable results on quality metrics, which you mentioned, but poorer results on cost savings. What's different about the CCO program that might lead to better financial results? That's a great question. Um, And I think there are some potential reasons. I can think of a couple. First of all, the success is really quite context-specific, I think. And um, Oregon policymakers, bureaucrats, healthcare providers, and health system administrators have 20 years' experience of innovative health care reforms. They're really, really well-versed and, and open to these innovative techniques. And also, the culture of medical care in the Pacific Northwest is very different than in many other areas of the country and emphasizes lower-cost care while, of course, maintaining professional ethics and high quality. In fact, the cost of care on average in the Pacific Northwest are lower, which is reflected by lower regional payment rates for Medicare and in other studies. But the culture and efficiency of care in the Pacific Northwest is really uh, likely a double-edged sword. Um, we're attempting to curb the rates of health care inflation in a program, Medicaid, that's already very lean in an area of the country that already provides care at lower costs. So you could think of that as voting poorly, potentially, for the overall success of the program. Um, even if some of these individual delivery reform techniques are proven to save money while maintaining quality, potentially they may not be enough to save the system. It's really a matter of a degree. Is there enough fat to trim off the steak, so to speak? Oregon got health systems to participate in the plan by including it under the umbrella of the Oregon Health Authority, which also oversees the Public Employees Health Insurance Plan. And the thinking is that no one wanted to risk being excluded from contracts with that plan. 
Do you see that as a coercive strategy or something that might work in other states as well? Well, I think uh, I think it's brilliant. Um, I'm not sure I should endorse the term coercive because uh, it has some negative connotations, of course. But clearly, the governor and the legislature of Oregon have created a system that has the potential to simultaneously improve outcomes and costs for both safety net patients and well-covered insured patients. And that's powerful. And they've linked the two in a way that has successfully enticed most major health systems to participate. You know, it wouldn't otherwise be possible to achieve major structural reform in a program like Medicaid and CHIP that covers a small proportion of patients and is relatively underfunded at baseline. But I think it's too early to declare victory uh, in this regard. The state leaders have to convince the public employees that participation would be to their benefit. But the level of sophistication is pretty high in Oregon for this sort of debate, and I'm confident that the, there will be minimal hyperbole and that the merits and demerits will be well addressed. I don't know about um, the environment in other states. I suspect that this sort of a leveraged approach would be very dependent on particular state politics, but may well be applicable. The Oregon plan involves a number of delivery system reforms, such as expansion of disease management programs, more flexible care, including expanded behavioral health services that are integrated with physical health services, improved care coordination, expansion of patient-centered medical homes. These are ambitious changes, and I think they'd take a fair amount of work to bring about. How far along is Oregon's healthcare sector in terms of implementing them? Well, as I mentioned, Oregon's healthcare sector at baseline has a, a greater than average sophistication in this regard, I think. However, this timeline is extremely ambitious, and I think that is one of the biggest potential reasons for failure of the program. Many things need to work very well for this program to succeed. Um, I think everyone would feel, uh, as would be expected in this scenario, that we're a bit behind, but that we're working hard and have a chance to catch up. I think in doing that, uh, integration and coordination are seen to be key to the CCO model. In your article, though, you talk about a somewhat fragmented system, especially in Portland, in which the largest CCO contains competitor hospitals. What's that CCO doing to address that problem? Uh, This is a tricky issue. Uh, In the rural areas of the state, just to to contrast, uh, CCOs are often constituted from one hospital system and one or maybe two groups of physicians, sometimes organized in IPAs. Uh, That's where the ACO model has its greatest chances of success, where the organization is accountable to a geographically defined community. So for many different reasons, that stacks the deck in favor of this model working, I think. Uh, In the Portland area, leaders have attempted to create a large CCO for most of the metro area but the enticements of cooperation and integrated participation in the CCO are really dwarfed, in my opinion, by the enticements for competition for commercial insurers. Um, Early dissonance in this kind of a situation is expected, I think, and I'm hopeful that the model can and will evolve. Uh, But if it does not evolve, I see serious challenges to its success. I think those involved are actively thinking about this and I know are um, really working towards success of the program. So I'm, I'm hopeful. And as a physician in Oregon, how do you see this experiment affecting you and your patients? Well, regardless of outcome, there'll be important positive effects on providers and patients. We'll, we'll become more acculturated to financially rewarding high-value care, and we'll gain the good habit of considering ways to improve health outside of conventional clinic and hospital visits. However, there's considerable risk. If this program fails, it could leave the Oregon Medicaid program in dire straits. And I'm not as sanguine as some of my colleagues who are policymakers and health services researchers, many of whom think that this risk, this risk of the Oregon Medicaid program ending up in tatters if this doesn't work, would be motivating for the average clinician or patient. I think it is very motivating for people who wake up in the morning and think about health policy. But for other people who who don't, um, I think we need to consider other ways to motivate them. So I think we really need to tie the motivating factors to the particular stakeholder groups and what's important to them. And failure of the program, although it would be catastrophic in my and many people's opinion, um, may not be equally motivating for everyone. And what do you think the prospects of success are? A, uh, A home run for delivery reform really requires a brilliant idea and brilliant execution, both. Neither one is sufficient alone. And I think everyone involved, the governor, CMS, health systems, and providers, 
could really improve the odds of success by focusing more intensely on the execution angle. Have everyone focus on efficiently developing tools and systems that experts think are most likely to achieve high quality and low cost over the next short term, the next 12 months, in the context of each CCO's individual challenges. And this really requires greater focus, greater coordination of efforts and ideas amongst CCOs, as well as greater integration within some CCOs. Thank you, Dr. Stecker. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you.